Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about virtual reality in sports broadcasting. My guest is Sankar J. Jayram, Chief Technology Officer of Intel Sports. Intel Sports is a division of Intel, the giant chip making company, and it's dedicated to applying virtual reality to major athletic events like Olympic competitions and pro football games. Their products were widely used in the 2018 Winter Olympics in South Korea. Jay has been a leader in virtual reality for over 25 years. He co-founded the Virtual Reality Laboratory at Washington State University in 1994. He also co-founded several VR companies, and his innovations have had a major influence on the whole field of virtual reality. One of his companies, Voke, was acquired by Intel in 2016, hence his current position there. Jay, welcome to the program. Great to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. Now, I didn't know that Intel was into sports. When did that get started? Uh, Intel sports got started about three years ago. Um, Intel acquired two companies. One was Vogue, uh, the company that I was a co-founder of, and another company was called Replay Technologies out of Israel. And Intel had some uh, teams within Intel that were working on sports technologies. They put these groups together and formed a new business unit called Intel Sports. So what do these products basically do? What do these products look like? So the, there are multiple technologies and products that have come together uh, from the two acquisitions and from within Intel. So I, let me first talk about the technology that came with me with my company. Can you please play video one, please? The, the technology consists of cameras that we, uh, special cameras that we have designed and created that have multiple lenses that point in all directions. So it's as if, if, you, if you have somebody sitting and looking out to the side, you have two eyes, we have two lenses. Look out this way, there are two lenses. You look out this way, there are two lenses. So we take all these lenses, put them into one camera, and we capture the videos from all of those cameras simultaneously we stitch them together so you have a seamless or almost seamless experience of a video that goes all the way from left to right and some 360 field of view, degree view. 180 or 360. Mm -hmm. You know, mostly we focused on 180 because of how sports uh, content is captured uh, with our cameras. And then you give that to the user, and the user can then get into a virtual reality headset and they can be looking around and looking in different directions from within that view. So you take this one step further, and instead of just having one camera at one location, which gives you a fixed seat in the stadium or in the basketball court, can you please play video two? And we, what we do is we put multiple of these cameras around the court, around the field, as, as this video shows. So you may have six or eight or 10 or 12 cameras in different vantage positions. And the user can then choose to be wherever they want to be at one of those positions and feel as if they are there and they're immersed. So this is live, immersive, virtual reality experience from the arena, from the stadium. So if you think of uh, NBA, you could have a courtside court seat. You could be sitting uh, next to the celebrities who are sitting next to you. So you, you know, one of the games we did, I look to the right, there's the team owner sitting next to me, I look to, the, to my left, and there's a movie star sitting next to me. So it's a really great experience. But then, you know, I choose to go under the basket. We have a camera under the basket. We have a camera behind the glass. So you can choose to just hover above the basket and watch the whole game as if you're sitting right there, perched up at the basket. So when you put the special cameras combined with the multiple cameras in multiple locations, and you, we also have the capability for a director or producer to choose the best camera for you if you 
don't want to be always selecting your own camera. They add graphics, you add statistics, and you create a brand new experience. So it's stitching all the images together in real time. That is correct. And at any point, you can say, I would like to see what this looks like from this specific location, and it'll generate that in real time from the existing data. Right, so this one, you can only choose where the physical cameras are located. So you can choose to be at camera one, or camera two, or camera three, or camera four, and at each location you have a full immersive experience. The second technology that Intel brought in with, uh, from the company called Replay Technologies, that one is a little different. Uh, can you please play video three? In that one, we have multiple cameras. These are not uh, 180 or 360 cameras, these are regular cameras, fixed lengths, uh, with uh, fixed focal length and everything else, that we position all the way around the stadium. Now here, we capture the video, but what we are really creating is recreating the digital space of that whole arena and of all the play that's happening out there. So you take all these cameras and you're triangulating the positions, and we capture what's called voxel. So think of that as a pixel that you see on TV, which is a picture element. Now make that in three dimensions. So instead of seeing a picture where you have these pictures of, of this glass on a TV screen, now I'm creating three dimensional pixels on the, uh, of the play or of the play field. So is that like voxels, that's like volume pixels? That's volume that? pixel. Can you please play video four? So these are volume pixels and uh, this video will show you an example of you know, how you can conceptually see, uh, that is video five, please go back to video four. Uh, if you look at the video right here, you can see this small square, and that's showing where we are digitizing. So you can see these little cubes that are representing the spaces on the field that are occupied by the players. So here, what we are doing is not just capturing the video, but we are recreating that whole space in a digital form that then allows us to do a whole lot more than the fixed cameras we had in the, in the other technology. So but how many cameras does it take in a big stadium to get the full effect? It, 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 it varies anywhere in the, in the 20s to the 40s, you know, depending on the stadium, depending on the, on the sport we are covering, whether it's basketball, whether it's football, whether it's hockey. You know, different sports have different needs, and different stadiums have different needs. It's right. to be customized that. Now, I think there's also something called a virtual camera. What's that about? That is correct. So when you think of this technology of these multiple cameras positioned all the way around the field and we're capturing and recreating the space completely, once you have that space recreated, like in computer graphics, now you have a model of the players of the field from the reality. And now you can create a camera that doesn't physically exist. And that's what we call a virtual camera. Please play video number five, please. In, in this video, you will see the concept of the virtual camera. If you look at the cameras, the red cameras that are in this video up on top, they, they represent the physical cameras. Now you can start with one of those, and this camera that's moving is a virtual camera. That camera does not exist. If you look at the bottom right, that shows a view from this virtual camera. We have gone all the way down to field level and getting a view of the field from a position where there really is no camera. So this allows us now to break all the barriers of, of the broadcasting cameras of having fixed cameras where you have three or four or five or 20 or even 30 cameras that you, people are used to using and that focuses on one area of the field. You get a shot with a specific zoom, with a specific lighting conditions, and that's all you got. And now you deal with it. You may have 20, you may have 30. Now here, we have the option of having an infinite number of cameras and you can go back and create new camera angles that you didn't capture. So you can have multiple virtual cameras at the same time? You can have multiple virtual cameras at the same time. You can post-process and create as many virtual cameras and as many uh, views of the same play as you want. Does it still take one person to decide where the virtual camera goes, or do you have some kind of artificial intelligence that chooses what the best angle is and what the best, it, like it, following the ball, for example? It, it, it's, a, it's a bit of both, right? You could do one or the other or both. If you think of, um, how it is today, right? So we are evolving. We had the live streaming virtual reality from fixed cameras. We had the virtual camera capability created not in real time, but we were able to produce with virtual cameras after the play. So if you watched uh, Super Bowl, uh, this past Super Bowl, you probably saw uh, the Intel virtual camera system, uh, which is called TrueView, in, in the sense that uh, when a play happens, 
after the play, we can freeze a moment in that play and the director can say, okay, I want a virtual, I want a camera that flies in this space, in this direction, and give me a shot of that. And we can create that virtual camera view of that play with the players on the field, with the ball, and, and all the players and referees and everybody else. And now you've got a virtual video that you may have seen on TV that also allows us now to create views from places where you don't have cameras, like the quarterback's helmet. So we can go all the way down into Tom Brady's helmet and see what he saw before he released that pass. Was he able to see the receiver, or did he know that the receiver was going to get there? Those are the things you can create, and we have done that already. Right. So to what extent is the technology out there? Can people get this at home at this point? Yes, yeah, so the, the true VR technology, which is a live streaming virtual reality technology, has been available for people at home for multiple years now. Um, we have been streaming um, NCAA March Madness uh, games uh, with Final Four um, and some of the games in the Sweet 16 as well. Um, those have been available for people to put on a virtual reality headset and get courtside seats uh, that we have been doing for multiple years. Uh, we have been streaming NBA games. In fact, uh, we are in the process of streaming some of the playoff games uh, as we speak. Now, can the home user control it, or do you still depend on the person directing it on scene to determine what camera angle you're going to get? So with the, with the live streaming virtual reality, you have choice of multiple real uh, 180 or 360 cameras, or you can choose to be in the director's cut. It's your choice. So you can choose to have a lean back experience where you're letting a director and producer say, okay, this is the best camera angle. Let's go to the, under the, be under the basket. Oh, let's go to the mid-court camera. Let's go to the slash camera. So you have the director or producer guiding you through that. Or you can say, you know what? I'm going to be sitting under the basket and watching the whole game. That's up to you. So we have those options that you can choose from. On the true view side, we have been so far using it only primarily for broadcast enhancement in the sense that you see it on TV. With the Super Bowl, we also launched a mobile app where the frozen frame, you can spin around the player or go into the quarterback's helmet and look around on a mobile device by you know, using your finger and, and panning around in the video, and you could see what the quarterback saw to the right or to the left. Now, virtual reality is often associated with wearing goggles of some kind. You're immersed in a computer-generated world. Now, these are real sporting events. It's not a computer-generated world, although the image you see is computer-generated. But do you need to wear goggles and control it like that in, in some of the products, or can you always just you watch it on your TV or a computer screen? So if you really think about it, the word virtual reality is an oxymoron. What is virtual cannot be reality. So when you think of virtual reality, people think about it as a virtual environment that's being brought into reality or you feel it as reality. Here, what we are doing is we are taking the real space, the actual game going on, the basketball going on, not computer graphics, and we are bringing it to you at home. Now we are using everything from uh, video technology, computer vision technology, computer graphics technology, and bringing it to you. So it is virtual reality because you feel you are in the game. You feel you are standing at the under the basket. You feel you are courtside watching the game. Now, the virtual reality headsets that you are talking about is one way you can consume it. When you expand that out, it's all about an interactive, personalized, immersive experience. Now, how you get immersed and how you interact with it could be many different forms. It could be on a smart TV. Could be on a laptop, could be on a mobile device, could be an augmented reality headset, could be a virtual reality headset. You know, there are so many different ways you could consume this and experience this. Now, this is a rapidly developing field. What are some of the things you're working on today, some of the enhancements that we might expect to see in the next few years? So you, you will see more and more of the true view-based capabilities coming to interactive experiences for fans at home. What this does is if you the two technologies, uh, the two primary technologies of true VR and true view, are kind of blending together. So you're using the, the best capabilities of both to bring it uh, to you at home. So think of the situation uh, where I talked about the, the NBA games we are doing today and the NCAA games we have been doing the last few years, where you can sit down and be at any one of those camera positions and look around and feel as if you are immersed in that environment. 
Now take away the limitation of that physical camera. Break those shackles. Now I can give you a camera anywhere on the core where a camera did not exist. And we can start giving you those camera positions. Uh, how cool would it be to be at the top of the key and watch the free throws being taken? Mm. And uh, watch the, the player coming and dunking the ball. Now it sounds like this technology could be applied to a lot of things in addition to sports. Are you looking into other possible uses for the technology? There, there are multiple uses for these technologies. In the past, uh, we have shown some of our virtual reality technologies used for everything ranging from concerts to security applications. Uh, but at Intel Sport, we made a choice to focus primarily on sport you know, from a business perspective. Uh, there will be other applications, and we'll be looking at those as we move along. Now, Intel is known primarily as a chip maker. Is Intel's main contribution to this technology developing new types of chips that can process this type of data? No, this goes beyond, beyond just chips. Uh, if you think about it, it's about data. Uh, it's not just about the chips, and Intel makes chips, but Intel has data centers, Intel has software products, Intel has hardware products, and Intel sports is uh, Intel's uh, entry into the world of the massive amounts of data in the future of sports and trying to figure out how the combination of the various technologies and various capabilities that Intel has blends with some of these new capabilities brought, brought into Intel by these two acquisitions they did and create a brand new experience in sports. Does it, does it take special cameras to do this, and does Intel make those special cameras? So I showed you a video of uh, one of the special cameras for the VR, the 180 camera in the beginning, but then when you look at the, uh, the true view system that creates a volumetric space, those are not special cameras, they're, but they're very specific cameras uh, that, we, that we do use, and we do have some special cameras coming as well because of the the capabilities we need from those cameras, the resolutions we need from those cameras, and the controls that we need from those cameras are not necessarily available out there. So we have to customize some. Is there a possibility that maybe we'll have too much data? Like after you've watched the game all the way through, maybe you don't want to go back and rewatch it from several different angles. Is there such a thing as information overload here? I don't think so. Not, you know, not for the generations coming after us. Uh, when I look at the next generation of uh, uh, sports fans and how they consume uh, sports and how they interact with their devices. Uh, my son or daughter, they are watching TV, there's sports going on there, they are on their phone, they are on Snapchat, they are on Instagram, they are on Twitter. It's, there, there's never an information overload. Uh, they, they are snacking everything all the time. So being able to provide multiple options really opens the door for these fans to stay engaged more. Otherwise, the, the uh, attention span of the sports fan is, is, uh, is shrinking. And they want these snackable you know, highlights. Even for me, I'm a, I watch sports all the time. And very often, I like to record the game, come back and just skip play to play to play. And my remote on my DVR has a 30-second skip, which, which is almost perfect from going from play to play to play in football. So watching so, a lot of very short segments. Short, watching a very, short, lot of very short segments. So now you want to let people have the experience of customizing those. So if I watch a play and I watch what's shown on TV, I want to stop right there and I want to get a different angle. Can I go and get a different angle from that play? I want to see from the other side. I think that was a passing difference. I saw the hand on the receiver's back when the ball was in the air. But I want to go back and see that and I can argue with my friend who was sitting next to me. Well, let me ask you this. What are some of the difficult challenges involved in creating this technology? Is it all straightforward? You know what you're doing? It's just a matter of time and resources? Or are there some basically tough problems that have to be solved to push this forward? We are sitting in a, in a production studio. You know all the technical challenges yeah. yep. <laughs> of, of producing yeah. an event, even producing yeah. an event with two people sitting at a table with the right cameras, with the right lighting, and the right audio, and everything else. Now you take that and expand that, that out into a football field with all the people and all the, and all the players where you're trying to digitize the whole space and 
creating those experiences and creating virtual cameras, everything from how you set up the cameras, how you calibrate the cameras, to how well aligned the cameras need to be, to the weather conditions, to the amount of data that is created, and getting all of the data out to a point where you're processing that information and getting the data all the way to the end user, that starts telling you why Intel. Who has the ability to process data at the cameras, stream the data, process the data, go to the cloud, go to data centers, go down all the way down to the end user and have devices that are capable of processing. I see Intel everywhere. Yeah. You know, we're talking about huge amounts of data. I was thinking that maybe you would want to record a two-hour football game and watch it at your leisure, but a two-hour football game recorded in this mode must be an enormous file. That is correct. So some of the, so going back to your question about challenges, uh, data is a huge challenge. Storage is a big challenge. Uh, the data, the bandwidth that you need to get data out of the stadium, once it's out in the cloud, yes, you can do all the processing you want. Getting back down to the user, how, do, how much data do you want to get down to the user? What we are doing today is going to be very different from what we'll do five years from now, very different from what we can do 10 years from now. So when you think about how internet speeds have progressed in the last 10 years, and you extrapolate where things are going, how processing speeds have changed over the last 10 years, how our consumption of media, think of 10 years ago what kind of uh, videos you are consuming on what device, and where are most people consuming sports today? On their mobile devices, on their tablets, on their laptops. So when you put all those pieces together, many of the challenges that we are facing today are not necessarily challenges, those are just evolution of different technologies that are going to make these new experiences possible. Like with L5 networks, that should speed things up quite a bit? The, yes, uh, those will speed things up, but you know, when uh, users get to, you know, there's so much going on with cloud technology. There's so much you know, processing that's happening in the cloud. Um, how much do we process in the stadium? How much do we process in the cloud? How much do we process in the cloud but close to the user so the round trip time is fast enough so I can get a really good experience and how much do you process on the device itself. There are all of these which are more than challenges, those are more of intelligent choices and design decisions you have to make as you build these technologies. Let's talk a little bit about the business aspects of it. So when you create these products, who is the customer? Is the customer the television network that's recording the Olympic Games? Is it the user watching it at home? Who are you selling the product to? So when you start getting into the business side of sport, it's, uh, it's one of the most complex uh, business uh, structures you can think of. You have leagues who have rights uh, to all of their content. They sell rights to rights holders, whether that's an NBC or a CBS or a Turner or a Fox or whoever that might be. And those rights are also in many different ways. There are live rights, there are live game rights, but not the full game. There are highlight rights that are within the game. There are highlight rights that are 90 minutes after the game. There are li rights for soccer that uh, come open 24 hours after the game or at midnight after the game. So there are a lot of these different rights holders and different ways that you can consume. So whether you're doing a live stream of a game or whether you're creating highlights that go on TV, whether you're creating highlights that go onto virtual reality devices or smartphones and smart TVs uh, during the game, after the game, all of these are different. And they're different for different leagues, they're different for different sports, they're different for different broadcasters, and they're different rights holders. Olympics, for example, they produce something uh, through what's called the Olympic Broadcasting Services, OBS, and that's streamed out to all of the rights holders. So US will have NBC, and there'll be uh, multiple channels in Europe, there'll be some in Korea. So when you think about it, we have to work across the plane of all of these people. In, for example, we do the NBA in partnership uh, with NBA and Turner Sports. We do Olympics in partnership with OBS, and then in partnership with different broadcasters in different nations. So we partner with multiple rights holders and multiple leagues across the world. Now it sounds like it could be a pretty lucrative field because it's a huge market. Do you have a lot of competitors? Are you ahead of everyone else or are there people trying to catch up? 
you know, there, uh, there's always, I always believe that if you have a really good idea you're working on, there are at least six or seven more people around the world who have had the same idea and have come up with similar concepts and ideas. The interesting thing is when you take virtual reality by itself, uh, there are you know, many companies, uh, two or three come to mind that we're doing something similar to Vogue in terms of trying to stream virtual reality in, in live environments to the world. And, and in many cases, you want your competition to be successful as well. It's a rising tide that, that, that you want to have that lifts all the boats because if you're the only person out there, the entire burden of creating a new medium and a new fan experience and educating the world and marketing to the world falls on you. But if you have competitors, then it kind of gets shared, and there's enough space for everybody in this world. Now, when you come to the volumetric side, there are, uh, there's very little competition at the scale that we are doing. You know, there's, yes, there are people capturing volumetric in small spaces uh, where you can create voxels for a person who's standing with cameras surrounding them and so on. But when you think of something as large as a football field, that's an enormous challenge. And uh, you know we are way ahead of anything that, that we have seen. Uh, but that's not to say that there's no competition. Sure, there are others who are doing, and they're also doing a good job of it. Um, it'll be uh, a, a change, a wave that uh, comes across sports. Well, companies learn from each other, and they leverage technology. In the old days, there was often the idea that if your company had a secret, you didn't share it, you kept it to yourself. Nowadays, it's a little harder to do that once technology exists. It's kind of open for more people to, uh, you know, leverage off each other, and that's propelling things at an exponential rate. I think it it it, it is um, the, the rate of change is constantly increasing at at a faster rate all the time. So when you think about it, um, uh, one is the information that's available. Uh, when something happens, the information spreads really really quickly. And uh, there's an interesting graphic uh, that, uh, that I use in some of my presentations and, and how long it took for um, the telephone to reach 50 or 75 million people was in, counted a number of years. And how long it, did it take for Pokemon Go to reach 75 million people is counted in minutes and hours. So when you, when you think of how information spreads today and how technology spreads today, it is, it is a situation where people are going to learn from each other very, very rapidly as well. And the sharing mechanisms are high. And there's a benefit to, uh, to number one, making sure your technology is available as widely as possible. You do want to protect your trade secrets. You do want to protect your competitive advantage. But at the same time, just like you learn from others, others learn from you. I'm going to have to stop because we are out of time. I'd like to thank you very much for being here today. Uh, Sankar J. Jayram, Chief Technologist at Intel Sports. I'm Marty Wasserman. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.